In Acts chapter 5, verse 16, I'll be reading this particular verse from the King James Version. <clears throat> it said, There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Read that one more time. There came a multitude out of the cities round about Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and a distinction in addition to sick folks, them that were vexed with unclean spirits. And the Bible said they were healed everyone, and it uses the word healing not only for people healed physically, but healed of vexating spirits. So, you may be seated, and I'm going to get right into it. I'm going to deal with a subject today that I have never preached on in all my whole ministry. I have always recognized it, but I have never really preached on it a series, I preached a message on it, I'm sure. But I'm going to be dealing with demonic vexation. And the reason why I'm going to be dealing with it is because demonic activity is increasing all around us, and you can tell it, can't you? You can see it. You can see it. And I'm not going to preach anything to you that is outside the Scriptures. I will only preach what I can prove from the scriptures, and if I preach something that I can't prove, I will say, I can't really prove this, but this is something that I want you to consider. I'll, I'll say that, but I'm going to only preach the things that I can prove, and uh, I'm uncomfortable preaching on this topic because, number one, I usually try to encourage God's people. I try to bring hope, and I try to preach on victory and other refreshing subjects, and I'll talk about negative things. Not afraid to do it, have always done it. My wife has been with me all these years, and she'll tell you that I am unafraid and unashamed to tackle any subject. It doesn't bother me at all. So, as I was thinking about preaching this series, I was questioning why now, all of, our, of all times, am I willing to deal with this subject? And the Holy Spirit reminded me of the Scripture where God said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And that knowledge is not just knowledge about the good, but knowledge about the evil. And so, people everywhere right now are talking among themselves about what's going on in the world. They're talking in beauty shops. They're talking in doctor's offices. They're talking in the mall, in grocery stores, banks. Even on the streets, they're talking about what the world's going on. There has been school shootings before. Now, there has just been another one. And I'm sure there will probably be a others to come. I'm sure they probably will be. So it's being talked about everywhere, but the thing that really amazes me, and one of the reasons why I felt compelled to get up and talk about it, is it's being talked about everywhere, but seemingly the church. And um, in church, it may get a brief mention every now and then, but it's usually passed over and ignored and swept under the rug. So I'm not going to be able to answer all the things that may be on your mind about the demonic and about the spirit world. I probably will not be able to deal with some things that you'd really like to have an answer to. I will not be exhaustive, and I won't try to be exhaustive as I delve into this because I'm probably going to preach at the most five to eight parts of this message. But I think I'll cover it in depth enough <clears throat> to the point that it'll help you understand the times 
that we find ourselves in. And this is my title right here. It's called Vexed. And that's a snake that you see in the background. Vexed. That scripture that I just read to you a while ago, I'll read it again, but you don't have to put it on the screen. Just leave that on the screen, if you will. It said, a multitude came out of the cities around Jerusalem bringing sick people and them that were vexed with unclean spirits. Now, whenever we talk about demon possession, I never think of demon possession as totally being demon possessed where something, an entity moves into a person and takes over their entire body. Like it's superimposed inside their body. I look at demon possession where they take control of the mind and the spirit. That's demon possession. It's usually a disembodied spirit, a disembodied evil spirit that moves into someone and takes control in many different ways but it usually doesn't control them 24-7. It usually takes control whenever it wants something to be known or wants to do something. But it usually doesn't take control 24-7 and completely rule that person 24-7. There's times that it goes quiescent. There's times that it backs off and you look at that person as mostly normal. But then it comes forth, and when it does, it's something to see, and it causes much damage. Now, it says in Matthew 17, and this is going to lead me to where I want to go. I've read this scripture before. I'm going to read it again today. I'm going to read both of these again today. I want us just to be at ease, look at it, concentrate on it, think about it. And when we think about it, let me talk to you and tell you some things that I want you to hear. When they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic and sore vexed. There's a word again, vexed. Oft times he falls into the fire and oft times into the water. And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And then in Matthew 15, two chapters previous, a woman came from Canaan. You remember God was going to bring the children of Israel through Joshua into the land of Canaan, out of Egypt. He said, it's a good land. So now the children of Israel are living there. Jesus is there on the soil. A woman of Canaan comes up to Jesus and cried unto him, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed of the devil, or vexed with the devil. Now I want to tell you something about how Jesus saw the devil possessed, and that's something that we're going to have to adjust our thinking to. Sometime when you see somebody that's demon-possessed, you're afraid of them. You see somebody manifesting a demon and you want to run, you're afraid of them. It scares you. But Jesus did not resent anybody that was manifesting a devil. Jesus did not run from them. Jesus was not afraid of them. Jesus was not ashamed of them. He looked at them with compassion. And if someone has a demon, of course it's something out of the ordinary, and of course it's shocking to see it and to hear it. But let me remind you also that demons also like a lot of attention. And there's mainly bluster. But when it comes down to casting the devil out, it's not really hard to do. And so Jesus looked at the, this these demon-possessed people that I just read about, he looked at them with compassion. Jesus was compassionate about everything toward everybody. Jesus was not exclusive. He did not have a, an entourage around him, like some kind of a guru. 
And everywhere he went, he had this entourage, and he was exclusive and looking down his nose at people. Ooh, get them away from me. Jesus looked at people with compassion. He knew what was going on in them. He knew what was going on with them, and he knew what was going on in them. And so I looked up, vexed, and it means these things. It means troubled, distressed, agitated, irritated, to be shaken and tossed about, afflicted, and harassed. Vexed means those things. And these people that came to Jesus said, my son is vexed to the devil. The devil takes him and throws him into the fire, <coughs> and the devil takes him and throws him into the water. And what he's actually saying is, if I wasn't there, I'm afraid my son would burn to death or drown to death. I can't rest because I know what these spirits are up to. They're trying to destroy my child. The woman said to Christ, have mercy on me, son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. What is the origin of demons? Who are they? Where do they come from? So there's two main theories, and these are only theories. One is, one theory is that there are fallen angels associated with Satan and his rebellion against God when God cast them all out of heaven. The second theory is that they are disembodied spirits of a pre-Adam time. Because the earth, as you see in the book of creation in Genesis, the earth was already created. It was plunged under water. Something had happened on the earth and it was plunged under water and water usually is a symbol of God's judgment and it's usually a symbol that if he plunged the earth under water, there was some kind of judgment that was brought about on the earth and there's no telling how long it had been like that before God started recreation. The second theory is that disembodied spirits are those that came from a pre-Adam race that perished under some kind of a judgment of God not recorded in great detail in Scripture. There's different places that I could go right now, but it would be too confusing for you for me to go there. I would lose you, and I'm not going to go there. But the Bible does not give sufficient evidence to say with certainty which of these theories are correct. So I'm going to tell you what my thinking is on it. It seems to me that even fallen angels are not recognized on the earth. They're recognized still in the heavens. Not the third heaven where God is, but in the heavens. They're what we would call the powers and principalities and rulers of darkness of this present age. They're the fallen angels that are up there in the heavenlies under the jurisdiction of Satan. And as everybody knows, Satan is not in hell. He's going to be cast into hell at the end of the millennium, or at the end of the tribulation, and then at the end of the millennium, he'll be cast into the lake of fire forever. But he's not in hell right now. And the spirits that followed him, the fallen angels, that followed Lucifer, they're still loose. And they also, structures, there's demonic structures in the heavens. There's traffic areas in the heavens where demons traffic or where devils traffic. And um, there's hierarchies, there's ranks of devils in the heavens. But usually... These spirits are the ones that we read about in the book of Ephesians. It says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That's not demons. That's fallen angels. Against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That, in my thinking, 
is fallen angels that was kicked out of heaven with Satan by God. And they're under his jurisdiction. They're under his command, under Satan's command. Those are the fallen angels. Demons, on the other hand, in my thinking, always appear in the earthly realm. They don't use, we don't usually read about demons in the heavenly realm. They display a wide range of traits. Some are vicious and violent. As we read about, the man said, they take my son and they cast him into the fire and they cast him into the water. Some, some demons are vicious and violent. Other demons are weak. Some even ridiculous, almost pathetic. <clears throat> and you would not find that in angels. Angels are always strong. They're intelligent. They are busy. You never find an angel, a fallen angel, like a weak, sniveling demon. So the Greek word for demon is daimonion. It's the Greek word, daimonion. It is an evil spirit it's a disembodied spirit. There is a hierarchy, as I said a while ago, of fallen angels. Principalities, I've told you this before, but a principality comes from the word principle. Every school, every middle school, grammar school, high school has a principle. That principle has jurisdiction over that school property, has jurisdiction over those teachers as jurisdiction over those students, over that real estate. That principle has jurisdictional rule. Principalities are the same way. They rule over places. They, they have jurisdictional rule, satanic jurisdictional rule. They not only have evil people in their sights, but they have saints in their sights also. They have us in their sights to do us, to hinder us. And to stop us if they can. To cause us to be halting. Demons seem to be the ones that, that's the muscle that carries out the dirty work of the fallen angels. Demons evidently stay on the earth. The Bible said when an unclean spirit has gone out of a man, it walketh through dry places it doesn't say it goes up into the third. It doesn't say it goes up into the first and second heavens. The third heaven is where God lives. God doesn't permit it. But you never find demons ascending up into the first heaven or the second heaven. It said they walk about in dry places seeking rest and finding none. Then he says, I will return to my house from whence I was cast out or came out. And when he's come, he finds it empty, swept, and garnished. But demons, I have never read anywhere in the Bible where they have ascended and gone up high. They always stay earthly. They are earthbound. So <clears throat> before I go any further, I just want to make it clear to you that I can't tell you where demons came from. Neither could my professors in Bible college. I have a whole litany of books at home on the subjects written by many, many great authors and commentators. Nobody has the answer. We don't know exactly where they came from, but most theological people do not feel like that demons are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness overseeing the work of Satan in the heavens. They don't believe that, and I don't believe it myself. So what are they? They could be disembodied spirits from a previous world. That's possible, but it's unprovable. The only thing I can tell you about demons is they're no good. <laughs> they're no good. Okay, now I want to talk about demon possession for a few minutes. Please understand that demons seek expression in the material natural world. They want to be heard. They want their voice and their message to be heard. 
They find a vessel that they can work and speak through, including politicians. Including charismatic people. Including important rich people. They find these individuals that they can work and speak through. They want to be heard. Their message and their doctrine wants to be spread. And they find the money, the people that has the money and the ability to be on television and to be heard. They find them and they use them. And you don't know a lot of times when you're watching television, you're listening to the doctrines of demons. And I, I think it's time that somebody gets behind their pulpit and says it. I really do. I really do. I'm not trying to get your applause. I just am trying to say to you, why in the name of God avoid this any longer? Somebody needs to get up and say, here's how it is. And not be afraid to say it. And not all evil spirits will sound devilish and demonic. Like, good morning. <laughs> Hi, good morning. You know, and, and they're not all going to sound devilish and they're not all going to sound sinister and macabre. You know, they're not going to sound that way. They're going to sound smooth, educated, they're going to sound convincing. They will have the wisdom of this world. They will have fallen wisdom. They will have earthly sensual wisdom. And it will be believable. It will sound like, well, my God, that's just the way it is. And them Christians has got it all wrong. They're the ones that's wrong. But I want to tell you something. The Word of God is right. Let every man be a liar. But the Word of God is right. So, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Just as God has the fivefold, Satan also has the fivefold. The church has pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets, and apostles for the perfecting of the saints. Don't kid yourself, Satan has evangelists. I mean, they are full of demons. And when you listen to them interviewed, you can't believe some of the things they say. But if you listen long enough, they'll sound plausible. And they'll sound believable. And they'll sound, well, that's not that bad. You know? But that's the evangelist coming out, the satanic evangelist coming out because he's trying to win you over. And I want to tell you something. The devil is making inroads into the church through many of these people today. That's why we've got to pray that God will raise up powerful evangelists, powerful prophets, and powerful apostles in this last day that will go forth and destroy the works of the devil. Woo! So, in order for the devil to be successful with the person, Satan is going to do everything he can to get that person to come into agreement with him. That's why I say he's going to make it believable. He's going to have sensual earthly wisdom. Satan operates by sensually, sensual earthly wisdom. God operates by God-ordained wisdom that comes from the Lord and comes from his word. Earthly wisdom, which is sensual, and earthly wisdom... That kind of wisdom is very provocative, very convincing, and that's the kind of wisdom that you can pick up on in universities through professors and through people that we see now in the last days being exposed like never before. Some of their doctrines that they're teaching our precious kids in their schools I tell you, I'm, I'm believing God that, that God's people in the church is going to pull their kids out of these unholy places. And I know that if you want to be a doctor, you want to be a dentist, or you want to be such and such, a lawyer, or whatever, I know that you have to go to these places and get your degree. I understand that. But you know what? I believe that God also can raise up other places where you can send your people and they can get the education that they need. But many of these places are nothing but dens of devils. 
Could I just go ahead and say it and make it clear? Many of the universities that used to be Christian schools like Harvard and different places like that used to be Christian schools. Now many of them have become dens of devils. All kinds of doctrines being taught, all kinds of things being perpetrated on our precious young people, and it's damning our nation. And it's time that somebody says it. it just say it. Just say it. I haven't got a thing to lose. Hey. If you don't want me anymore, I'll pack my suitcase and go to the house. I got things to do. But as long as I'm behind this desk, I'm going to tell you what I think. And this is what I think. I think that right now America is being duped by many in courts and high places, and they're making decisions that's not in the best interest of the American public. It's in the best interest of the elitists. And I want to tell you something else. I believe that many times when a man runs for president and when a person runs for the Supreme Court and things like that, I believe many times when they run that they're sincere as they can possibly be. And they plan on going to Washington to make a difference. But I believe when they get there, there's such a powerful principality over those areas. There's such a powerful cloud and principality over those areas that they dare not go against it. And many succumb and give into it and become a different person than what you elected. Why? Because it's the powers that be that do not want to give up rule and authority over America. But if the Supreme Court is not careful, instead of making decisions on the behalf of the Constitution and the American public, if they're not careful, they're going to come under agreement with strong principalities. And they'll make decisions that's going to bind up the nation rather than set the nation free. And I want to tell you this. Before the midterm elections, you'll probably never know who leaked that information about Roe versus Wade from the Supreme Court. I believe it was leaked personally. I believe it was leaked on purpose. And I believe it is the devil's way of trying to prepare the American public to be so provoked that they won't vote for people that wants to do right. They're going to vote for people that will continue abortion. But let me make a proclamation this morning. Abortion is coming down in America. It's coming down in America. It's coming down. Somebody shout amen. It is. It's coming down. You may be seated. And we have come into agreement long enough with these controlling spirits and these lying spirits and these dark deceptive spirits. Something is happening. I see it happening all over America in a bad way. I see darkness increasing everywhere, but I also see God moving and God is about to rise up. God is rising up. Is rising up. God is rising up. God is rising up. God is rising up. God is rising up. The church is rising up. The church is rising up. Okay. You did good. Now shout. God bless President Trump for putting God-fearing people on the Supreme Court. Because contrary to what a lot of people believe, I believe that they will wind up doing the right thing. 
but we must pray for them because you think principalities and powers are strong here in Alabama? Go up to Virginia and Washington, D.C. area and see what you feel. We need to pray for the Supreme Court that God will send a mighty wave of revival to Washington, D.C. We need revival in this land, and we need revival at the seat of government in the highest places. So what Satan wants you to do is come into agreement with him. Be careful before you ever come into agreement with the devil. It may sound like the right thing to do. It may sound like wisdom. It may sound like, yes, that's what I think too. And the devil will make you sound so smooth and so believable. But watch, before you ever come into agreement with the devil and take enough time to see if that's in agreement with the Word of God. And if it's not in agreement with the Word of God, don't come into agreement with it no, how, no matter how good it may sound. So unclean spirits, what they really want is to, to be normalized. They don't want to be looked at as demon spirits anymore. And they don't want demon-possessed people to be looked at as demon-possessed people. They don't want them to be looked at like weirdos. They want them to be looked at as normalized. And we've learned that by Washington, D.C., what it's producing. And we've got to raise up people in this country that will go to Washington and not just face down a Democrat or not just face down a Republican, but face the devil down and do what's right for this country. The Bible said when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest. Satan, a demonic spirit, wants to find rest in a person and doesn't want the church fooling with them. Doesn't want the worship to stir up anything in people like that. And doesn't want the preacher to be anointed behind the pulpit as to stir up those spirits in those people. He wants them to fit right in the congregation. Everybody's fine, I'm fine, you're fine, the church is fine, everything's fine. But when the anointing of the Holy Ghost comes, the go ahead, it's all right. Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to set the captive free. That's what he does. Oh. The Bible said that there was a man in the synagogue, Mark chapter 1, with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, and it said, let us alone, right in the house of God. Let's back up just for a minute. There was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. How did he get there? Well, how does he get in most churches? How does he get in most churches? Listen, you may look at me and think, well, pastor, you're just, re you're really meddling. No, I'm really telling you the truth. And you're just now seeing it while I'm telling you the truth. You know it's the truth. Let's say it. Here's the man in the synagogue with an unclean spirit, and he cried out in the church, leave us alone. Why? Because we found us a nice place here. We're happy here in the synagogue. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know that you are the Holy One of God. Well, I have a question. It seems like to me that the Holy One of God ought to have a place in the synagogue. And it seems like the one that's there is questioning the one that has the right to be there. I was looking at this this week when I was getting ready to preach on this. <clears throat> I want to talk to you about this particular passage of Scripture. I'm going to read it. <clears throat> I'm going to read all of it because I want to read it again like we've never seen it before. What's happening to me in these days that we're living in right now is I'm, I've been preaching the Bible for over 50 years. And I've loved the Bible. And I love it right now. But it's like all of a sudden... In the last couple of years, I'm going back and reading things I've always read, 
But now it's like something's been removed off of it, and I'm reading it for the first time. Y'all see what I'm saying? And I want you to look at what this says about this guy. It says they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes over against Galilee, and when Jesus went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devils a long time. How long, I wonder? It just says a long time. And he had no clothes on. He wouldn't live in a house. That means even in thunderstorms and clement weather, cold weather. But he lived in the tombs. He lived out in the tombs. And he saw Jesus and he cried out. Isn't it amazing that every time demons saw Jesus, they cried out? You know what it is? When you see the holy, the unholy can't be quiet. And he cried out and he fell before him. And with a loud voice, he said, what have I to do with you, Jesus, you son of the most high? I beseech you, torment me not. For he commanded the unclean spirits to come out of the man. For oftentimes, the spirits caught him, it says. They caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters. And he broke the bands of the chains and the fetters. You know, it's a pretty strong guy, a flesh and blood man, to take a steel chain and snap the chain. That's a pretty, I mean, that's superhuman strength. And um, he broke it, broke the fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus asked him, well, son, what's your name? He said, Legion. You know something? This man's name could have been Frank. It could have been John, it could have been Joe, it could have been Sam. But when the devil's in you, you lose your identity. The only thing the devil wants to do is, the only thing the devil wants to do is let himself be known. Not you, because you don't matter, I'm what matters. See, the devil never loves you. Jesus loves you, but the devil loves himself. And he's taking advantage of you. He's taking advantage of your daughter. He's taking advantage of your son. And he's taking advantage of you. Jesus said, what's your name? He couldn't even answer. My name is John. My name is Joe. My name is Sam. He couldn't even answer it. All he could say was, legion. And you know what? I looked up legion. And in the Roman army, a legion of soldiers was 5,000. When this man said, my name is Legion, it meant that that man was carrying 5,000 demons inside of him. <clears throat> Watch this. What is your name? He said, Legion, because many devils had entered into him and they besought him that he would not command them to go into the deep. And there was a herd of how many swine? Many swine, many, feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them to enter into them and he suffered them. <clears throat> and... The devils went out of the man and entered into the swine. Many swine, many swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. And when they that fed the swine saw what was done, they fled. It scared them. And they went and told it in the city and in the country. And then they went out to see what was done and they came to Jesus and found the man of whom the devils were departed sitting at the feet of Jesus clothed in his right mind and they were afraid. What? Wait a minute. Here's a man naked, completely naked, couldn't keep chains on him. He lives in the tombs. He's a wild man and they wasn't afraid of that. But Jesus makes him normal and everybody's afraid of him. Isn't it strange? You can get used to church being so dysfunctional that when revival comes and makes it functional, everybody gets upset about that. And the Bible says they came out of the city and the country and they begged Jesus to depart from them. The whole multitude of the country, the Gadarenes, <clears throat> round about besought him to depart from them. 
And they were taken with great fear. They, they asked Jesus, leave, leave. The demonic man had a place, but the one that cast the devils out had no place. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? Here's what I'm trying to say to you. Remember a while ago I told you that them demons want to be normalized. And what they had done is they'd taken this man and he was violently full, full of the devil, possessed by thousands of them, and he had normalized them. Demons had normalized themselves to the people in the city and the country. And they were normal with that. Okay. So Jesus comes, casts them out. They go into swine. Swine goes in, and they die. And, and they come to Jesus. Get out of here. We're afraid of you. That's what I'm saying. Be really careful. Be really careful that you don't get normalized by things that you see on television. Be careful that you don't get normalized by political messages today. Be careful that you don't get normalized by things that they tell you that you must believe because they want it to be normalized, and if you say anything, you're not going to be part of it, and they're going to ask you to depart. It's, what, what do they call it? Uh, what kind? Cancel culture. They wasn't wanting to cancel culture. The, the demon-possessed man, they wanted to cancel culture of Jesus. This man had 5,000 demons. If, if he had 5,000 demons, which was the number of a legion of the Roman army, if he got on the scales and weighed, and he weighed 152 pounds, after Jesus cast the 5,000 demons out of him, he'd still weigh 152 pounds. Because the demons are not matter. They're not flesh and bone. They're spirits. And spirits have no weight. But those 5,000 spirits was in that man and they kept him out of his head. He thought it was normal to be naked. He thought it was normal to be able to break chains. He thought it was normal to live in a, in a graveyard 24-7. Those spirits had a hold of him and it wasn't like 5,000 people on the inside of him. It was 5,000 tormenting spirits in his life that kept him from doing anything. Don't you think for a minute that if you yield to Satan, that he can't keep you from the things that's normal and the things that you love. And you can't even see it. You can't even understand it. You won't want to understand it because you have now come into agreement with the devil. And once you come into agreement with the devil, it would seem so odd not to agree with that anymore. And so Jesus came, and the world had been without a prophet for 400 years. And the people that Jesus came to was the Jews. And they had the teachings of Moses. They had the Levitical law. They had Judaism. They had all those things. They had the teachings of all the greats, and when Jesus came, even the Jews were possessed by devils. I have a question. If the Jews were possessed by devils, what was the rest of the world like? So when Jesus came, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me. When Jesus came, he was like a walking personal revival that everybody needed, but nobody wanted. Amen? Is that the truth? They needed what he had to say. But now watch this. I got, I got, I got a lot more ground to cover for this. Let me get through with this. So those demons left him and drowned the swine. No wonder this man was naked living in those tombs because he was, had so many things, such confusion. How did 5,000 demons get in a man? You know what? I would venture to gamble. Pardon the expression. You know what I would venture to say? 
I would venture to say that there's people today alive that has more than 5,000 demons. There's no telling how many demons some people have. There's no telling how many demons, how many hundreds and thousands and millions of demons are living in certain cities in America, much less godless nations of the world. And no wonder you feel different when you get into certain places. You can feel that. Your spirit man's picking up on it. Okay. Let me show you how Jesus handled this guy. He cast the devils out of him. <clears throat> now, after Jesus had mercy on him, had compassion on him, cast the devil out of him, now all of a sudden the guy's clothed and in his right mind he's not in the, he's not in the tombs anymore. And now he's, he's living like a normal person. Jesus is getting ready to leave. And here comes this person running after Jesus with the clothes on. He says, oh, master, he said, can I go with you? Isn't that amazing? I wonder how many people today are so messed up, but if we could have a real Holy Ghost revival, how different they would be. I wonder how different they would be if they could be a real Holy Ghost revival and put these things to rest, deal with these spirits and deal with these strongholds, get them out, deal with them. The blood of Jesus Christ can break every fetter. Now watch this. The man comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, could I go with you? I'd like to be an evangelist with you. That's not what he said in the Bible. That's what I said. Come on. But he said, can I go with you? And Jesus said, no. He said, you know what? I want you to stay here because you're known here. If I take you with me, nobody, your story won't be that important wherever you go but your story is really important here. You, you can be more effective here. So he said, I want you to stay here, son, and, and tell everybody what happened. And when they see you clothed and not living in a graveyard, you can tell them, Jesus did that for me. See, that's revival. Oh, my God. Lord, send revival to America, Lord. Come on, help me, church. Let's pray. Lord, send revival to America, Jesus. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enter into something right now that I want you just to really pay close attention. I don't want you to lag behind me. I want you to stay with me because you could really misinterpret what I'm going to say if you don't stay with me. And I'm going to try to say it the best I can. This man came to Jesus, and I'm going to read it one more time. I know I've been reading it a lot lately, but I've got to read it one more time. A certain man kneeling down said to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic. He's sore vexed, and oftentimes he falls into the fire and oftentimes into the water. So this father brought his boy to Jesus. Now, there's so many things about this story that my mind is pregnant with. The Spirit had such a hold on this little boy the Bible said the boy was sore vexed, not just vexed, but sore vexed. He really was under the control of the Spirit. It tossed him into the water, deep water, and if somebody wasn't there to get him out, he'd drown him. Throw him in the fire, and if nobody got him out, he'd burn him. My question is this, how old was that boy? Was he five? Was he 10? Was he three? How old was he? Don't know. If you read commentaries, they'll guess, but all they can do is guess because the Bible doesn't say, and if the Bible doesn't say, it doesn't say. But I believe he was, he was an adolescent. I don't believe he was a teenager or a young man. I believe he was an adolescent. How does an adolescent become demon-possessed? So with that said, and with me putting that in your mind, I want to take it another step further. Could a child as young as three years old be demon-possessed? Could a child as young as one-year-old be possessed? Could a child be demon-possessed in the womb? I want you to just think about it. 
I'm going to let you make the decision. But I'm going to tell you some things that I want you to think about, but I'm not going to tell you how to think or what to think. I'm just going to give you some things to think about. Some mothers, especially single mothers, <clears throat> were drug addicts when they carried their children. And a lot of times they weren't just drug addicts, but they participated in occult and witchcraft events while they were pregnant. Even some adoptive parents uh, found out when they got their babies and held them that the babies didn't want to be held and would cry every time they picked them up. <clears throat> The child didn't want to be held. The child didn't want to be rocked. The child didn't want to be loved on. The child didn't want to have you put your cheek up to its cheek. The child didn't want you to hold it up to your breast. Didn't want to be breastfed. You try to pick them up, and the older they get, they push you away. No. They seem to be unable to be comforted. No matter as that child would grow, no matter how much you may try to include that little child or make them feel loved, these babies and young children do not want any kindness, no tenderness, no good words. And the parents many times cry out in desperation, oh my God, what have we done? How have we failed our child? And many times the parents hasn't failed the child at all. The parents have done a stellar job of being good parents to that adopted child. And it's not that way in all cases. I'm just talking about a few cases. Many cases are very successful. <clears throat> but this reminds me of a reverse in the book of um, Luke chapter 1. And the Bible said it came to pass when Elizabeth heard the words of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Not born yet. A baby in her womb. And Mary is over there crying, my soul shall magnify the Lord. My soul, and she's singing the Magnificent. And then she's prophesying over that baby. And the Bible said that baby in Elizabeth's womb leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Oh my God, two people. The baby was filled with the Holy Ghost and the mother was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. Oh, man, this causes me pain right here. Because I love children. an innocent little baby in a mother's womb done so bad. He needs love. He, she needs tenderness. She needs words of affirmation. That baby heard that mother. That baby heard Mary's voice as she was glorifying God. He heard his mother as she responded to a Mary, the baby in the womb, heard it all and was jumping for joy. How many kids in the womb have heard their mother say, I hate this piece of... Wish I'd have never had it. And the mother's shooting up on heroin and the baby is born in convulsions as a heroin addict. And now I have a question for you. Just want you to listen to me. So we see a young man, 18 years old in Texas, get two rifles. He goes into a school and he murders those children. Despicable, evil. Only have one question. What about the shooter? What did he come out of? Was he one of those babies in the womb? Because they said he was quiet all of his life. 
You see, this is my take on it. I'm probably going to come under a lot of criticism for saying this, but I've already counted the cost, so I'm going to say it anyway. There's just some things that's worth the cost. But I think a lot of these young people today that they're confused about their gender is because of what they've heard said about them while they was in the womb forming. While they're in the womb forming and their little heart is starting to beat and their little fingers are beginning to form fingernails. Now, you have all these things that's happening and all these things that's being said and all these things that's happening to these children. And a lot of times these little children in the womb get confused about who they are. And before they ever see the light of day, they're not sure if they should live. That's why many of them are born suicidal. That's why many of them are born in depression. That's why many of them are born, they don't know if they're a male or female. They don't know who they are. They never got affirmation from their mother and there was no daddy to give them affirmation. And I was watching on TV whenever I saw all this happening and coming down to Texas. And it was so gut-wrenching to watch it, all those parents that lost their children. But then whenever I began to see that they would flip over for just a quick second and tell about this shooter, they said that he had never had a home life. There was never a father there. And the mother never loved him and never wanted him and told him she didn't want him and he was living with his grandmother and she was about to put him out so he shot her in the face. Total rejection. I'm not saying that sympathetically toward him. Here's what Holy Spirit said to me when I was watching that and this is why I decided to preach on this. This is exactly right here why I decided to preach this message and preach this series. This Holy Spirit said, son, there's a whole crop of them coming on right now. There's a whole crop of them that's coming on from that era that was drug babies, unwanted, uncared for. And that's why you see all the transgender stuff that's going on out there today. People don't know who they are. And even the politicians now are saying on, on the bathroom doors, you know, we're not going to put up there male or female. And a, a, a male can have a sex change and go in and compete with females. We are a screwed up nation. We are a screwed up nation. And let me tell you what I, what I believe. I believe it all goes back to the womb. Because listen, there's been a war on the womb, period. And many have, many have been killed in the womb, but the ones that did survive the womb are casualties also. And the Lord said to me, there's a whole crop of them coming on. And what's the church going to do about it? Jesus had compassion. What's your name, son? Legion. He couldn't even give him his name. So controlled by the devil. He didn't say, my name is Joel. My name is Levi. Legion. Because Satan comes to steal, to kill, and to utterly destroy. As Mary, on the other hand, my soul does magnify the Lord. That little baby in there heard that. My soul does magnify the Lord. That's the mother of the Redeemer of the world singing. And what was in the womb could hear it through his mother's ear. He just leaped for joy. He was so happy. What has happened to our country? With the breakdown, I watched some of the news channels when they had the killings in Texas. I watched some of the news channels, and here's what I heard some of the anchors say. What has happened to our country? So they're asking that question. 
They're asking it in the beauty shops. They're asking it in the banks and the malls and the hospitals and the doctor's offices. But they're not going to ask it in church because they know they won't get an answer anyway. Because nobody wants to talk about it. Listen, we better talk about it. I'm telling you, people today that sit in our church pews, they want to know, and we better start trying to provide some answers. So let me, let me close with this. Ooh, I didn't even get through a point one, much less point two. But here's what some of the anchor people were saying that when I was watching. They said, it has to be the home. It has to be the home. There's such a breakdown. There's no, there's no fathers at home anymore. And many of the, uh, many of the, uh, uh, the black families and the Hispanic families and, and even the white families, there's no father at home anymore. And the mother's having to work several jobs and there's, there's nothing hardly to eat. And, and these kids are coming up and they're being cussed and they're being slapped and they're being told, I didn't want you in the first place. And the white American church goes all about their business, enjoying our good little services, and don't bother us with that. I was at a drive through restaurant here about three months ago, I would guess. I pulled up at nighttime, and I was getting something to eat. Brenda didn't know about it. <laughs> and I pulled up, and I ordered, and there was a, a little guy in there. He didn't say a word after I, before I ordered, didn't say a word after I ordered. So I ordered, and when I ordered, he leaned his head out the window like this and put his hands in his head and just stared at me in like a demonic way, just glaring at me, just staring at me. I rolled down the window and I said, hi. I said, do I know you? He said, no. I said, do you know me? He said, no, and I don't want to know you. <laughs> my first inclination was to pull him out of that window into my window. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first inclination but we've wrestled not against <laughs> that came to my mind first and I was going to pull him right up my face and say can you see me a little better now son <laughs> but I didn't and I just looked at him and I pulled away because I didn't want to eat the food because I was afraid to eat the food now <laughs> Isn't it pretty bad that you're afraid to eat the food because of the way somebody looks at you? But it's coming to that. That's why I'm talking about demons right now, because you're going to be facing it yourself. Have you noticed lately, when you go in anywhere and just try to be friendly to somebody, they're mean back to you? Have you noticed that? And that's not just in Alabama. That's anywhere you go now. You just try to be nice to them, like, hey, how you doing? <clears throat> Okay. <laughs> but I remember I was pastoring a church in Georgia years ago. I was young. We had a bunch of neighborhood children around the church. It was a bad area, you know. This one little girl, I never saw her with her hair combed. She always wore a dress and her sashes was always untied. She had no shoes on. Her ankles was filthy dirty every time I saw her. Her hair was even matted. And I'd go out sometime and I'd shoot basketball with them, you know. I'd throw the ball with them and just, you know, talk to some of the neighborhood kids. So she really took a liking to me, man. She loved me. Her name, I think, if I can remember, her name was Lori. L-O-R-I, Lori. And I stayed there two years. And right before I resigned to move to another place in Georgia, she came up to me one day and she said, Reverend, I'm going to be moving. I said, you are? 
And she put her hands on her hips like this, and she looked at me, and she says, well, aren't you going to cry? <laughs> you know what? I broke down crying. Because what she was saying is, am I important enough in your life to cry over me? Because she basically was saying, nobody ever cries over me. How many people are like that? How many people are like that? Nobody to love them. Nobody to say sweet nothings to them. Nobody to hold them. Nobody to put their little cheek up to their cheek. Nobody to kiss them. I don't know what I'd do without you. I don't know what I did without you before you came. And one of, the reasons, one of the ways demons enter is through rejection. And it's diabolical to even say that, but when somebody's rejected and they're hurting so bad, that's when demons enter. Because there's nobody there to tell them. And that's why I want to say this to the church today, to the white church. Get out of your world. And start looking around you and realize there's a world out there, a big evangelistic field out there, people that needs us. I want you to take your Holy Communion. I want you to stand with me, please. Hmm? You know what we're talking about here? We're talking about demonic spirits and vexation. There's seven things I want to cover with you real quickly before we take Holy Communion. There's seven things I want to bring to your attention for us to break free from demonic activity in our life and to stay free from it. Number one, affirm your faith in Jesus Christ and his shed blood. How many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he shed his blood on Calvary for us? And let me tell you something. That's the only reason why you're here today clothed in your right mind is because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Just think where you could be. Just think where I could be. Number two, humble yourself. How do you break free from demonic activity in your life? Humble yourself. Ask God for mercy to completely set you free. Not 90%, 100% set you free. Number three, repent of all sins. Acknowledge that you have sin to repent of. Give no place, the Bible says, to the devil. You want to face your addictions head on, no matter what your addictions may be. And there probably is more addictions in this room than what you would believe. You want to hit, you want to hit your bondages head on. All kinds of bondages that's had you from being truly free in your lifetime. Maybe go all the way back to since you was a little boy or little girl. Then repent of all occult practices. Anything that you have said, chanted, done, relics, anything that you may have that has to do with the occult, remove yourself from it totally because it has power. Number four, you've got to forgive everyone. You've got to forgive everyone. Oh, my God, I'm going to be on this next week. You've got to hear this part. I'm going to cover three areas next week. You've got to hear them all. And I want you to be here in person. I want you to be here to receive this communion in person. I don't want you to watch it on TV. There's people that has to, but I want you to be here. I'm going to be in North Carolina Thursday, but I'm going to race right back to preach to you Sunday morning, but I want you to be here. Put forth enough effort to come. It's important. 
And I'm going to tell you something. It's not as important now as it will be six months from now. Forgive everyone. It's a decision that you must make. It's not an emotion. It's a decision. Anyone that's ever harmed you or wronged you, you're going to forgive them. Lay all bitterness, all resentment, all hatred aside. Number five, sever all bad soulish relationships. The ones that you have not totally severed, but you keep dabbling in it. Do away with all articles of, of affection that you received from those that you had a relationship with that wasn't approved of by God. Get rid of it once and for all. It still has power over you. You better hear me. All I can do is tell you. I can't make you and wouldn't if I could. But you better hear me. Sever all soulish relationships that you have not totally severed in the past. They still have room. They still have a place and they still play with you. Do away with all articles of affection. Maybe a, room, a ring that a lover gave you. And now you're married, but you still wear your lover's ring and you haven't even told your husband. Other articles, pieces of clothing are something that someone gave you from a way back and you can't let it go because you still clutch it and it brings back comfort to you. It's called an article of affection. Number six, Renounce all satanic inroads and acknowledge that Satan has made some inroads in your life. Acknowledge them and turn from them. Turn from them totally. And number seven, be baptized in water. Water baptism, water baptism separates us from our past. It's what Jesus introduced. He introduced it. His cousin John was John the Baptist. Being baptized in water separates you from your past. It is a public profession that you are making that you have left the old life behind and you have made a decision to totally follow Jesus Christ in newness of life. I don't think I have ever loved and respected and cherished the blood of Jesus like I do just studying to preach this stuff because this is the only antidote to demons. You can shout all you want to shout. You can cry all you want to cry. You can beg all you want to beg. But when you say, in the name of Jesus Christ and by his shed blood, I bind you in Jesus' name. There's power in the blood of the Lamb. Come on, say it with me. There's power in the blood of the Lamb. Let's partake together. Woo, I feel the Holy Spirit in here so strong. Jesus, I feel the Holy Spirit so strong. Jesus said, this is my body. My body, I gave it to you to be broken. Not for me. Not for my Father. Not for the angels, but for you. I gave my body to be broken for you. Because there are Areas in people's bodies, not all sickness, but some sickness is spirits of infirmity. And I'm going to be talking about that. And we're going to be praying for people at the end of the service. I'm going to be on this about five weeks. But Jesus said, I give my body to be broken and I'm doing this for you. Not doing it for anybody else, including myself. I'm doing it for you. Take, eat, he said. This is my body. 